emulate our records. So you need a place to put them that's organized in a way so you can find information easily. Something like this. For hundreds of years, no matter what you were selling, the process of doing business came down to these basic steps. Recording, managing, and organizing certain key pieces of information. And for most of that time, it was all done with this or these and lots of paper. All along, there was a simple process driving the evolution of the business office. The faster you could write things down, the more organized your records were. The more efficiently you could send out bills, the more money you could make. A more efficient office was a more profitable office. And people realized this early on, and they came up with all sorts of simple innovations in the business environment. Things as simple as this letterbox, for example. It's a temporary storage space defining work coming into and going out of your particular area of responsibility. It really helped improve efficiency. We still use them. Small improvements like this came along rapidly all through the 19th century, but when electricity came into the picture, the business office was transformed. With the telephone and the teletype, you could take orders, promote products, and send bills out to customers thousands of miles away in a fraction of the time it would take to do it by mail. Early dictating machines enabled a person to prepare correspondence and instructions to be acted on later, giving people a more effective way to manage time. And calculating machines freed business accountants from the centuries-old limitations of pencil and paper. All these developments helped increase the pace of business in the early 20th century to a level never before possible. By the 1950s, a technology boom was pushing things even faster bringing time and labor-saving innovations to the business environment almost daily. And then in the 1970s, business equipment manufacturers got hold of this, the integrated circuit. And things would never be the same. With the introduction of large-scale integrated circuits and the new products they made possible, the business environment was no longer simply mechanized. It had become automated. Office automation has revolutionized the way we do business. It's given us voice communication systems that are more efficient and more flexible. It enables us to exchange visual or electronic information between customers and suppliers any place on earth in a matter of seconds. And for record management, it can put the power of electronic data processing on a single desktop all at a cost easily tailored for even the smallest company. When we need the convenience and portability of paper, office automation technology provides a full range of options. Our business information can be printed, reproduced, or destroyed. You're watching the first in a series of programs devoted to office automation basics, the fundamental processes that make some of this technology possible. In this program, we're going to look at copiers. But before you learn how copier technology works, it helps to understand its history. And before you focus on that, make sure you make the distinction between copying and printing. Copying is an office concern making small quantities of just a few pages or even a single page. Printing is an industry by itself, devoted to producing very large numbers of one page, often for the purpose of making a book, magazine, or newspaper. Printing technology experienced innovations and increased efficiency long before any such advancements came to the world of copying. Offset printing and mimeograph equipment produced hundreds of copies a minute for little more than the cost of the paper. But they were only practical if you wanted to make hundreds of copies. What business offices needed was a way to make single copies that was inexpensive, very fast, and used hardware that was easy to operate. And until the 1960s, most offices relied on this, carbon paper. Boy, you talk about business traditions. Carbon paper had been around since about 1900. It was certainly cheap, and if you used a few sheets and you pressed hard enough, you could get three or four copies in one shot. Of course, you had to know you wanted those copies while you were creating the original. And if you wanted to copy a letter from someone else, 
carbon paper couldn't help you at all. For that, you had to rely on conventional photographic methods involving a camera, wet chemicals, washing and drying time. Not the kind of system you need to get a quick report out the door. The first important advancement came in 1953 from the German photographic giant, Agfa Gewehrt. They introduced the diffusion transfer process, shown here with modern equipment. The process still used a camera, but no negative. Instead, the image was exposed directly onto a special light-sensitive sheet called a master. After exposure, it was run through one chemical bath and squeezed against a transfer sheet with a pair of rollers. You waited a minute, peeled them apart, and you had a high-quality copy of anything. A big improvement, but you still got only one copy from each master. Not to be outdone, in 1954, Eastman Kodak introduced Verifax. This process photographed an original with a master which, instead of developing into light and dark areas, produced hard and sticky areas. The developed sheet was squeezed against special copy paper with a set of rollers, and the sticky image areas on the master adhered to the paper. The big improvement here was that you got about 10 copies from every master. Multiple reproduction was getting easier. In 1956, 3M Corporation introduced Thermofax, a thermal transfer process. Here's how it worked. To start with, an original had to be created with some kind of heat-absorbing ink. Inside the machine, the original was heated very rapidly and then pressed against a special copy paper. Image areas on the original became hot enough to burn a copy into the surface of the heat-sensitive paper, like this. Thermofax had its drawbacks. You couldn't copy anything that didn't absorb heat inside the machine, particularly pencil. And the copies tended to fade, but it was better than anything else. Making a copy was fast, just a few seconds, and inexpensive. In the meantime, other people were working in different areas, moving away from the established technology. In 1955, the E-STAT process appeared. E-STAT was a different approach to copying, very high tech for its time. It used a direct electrostatic system, which exposed and developed an image directly on special copy paper treated with zinc oxide. The paper was gray and difficult to write on, but the machine and the copies it produced were cheap enough to be within the budget of even the smallest company. Things were looking up. Then, in 1959, the Halloid Corporation in Rochester, New York, introduced a machine that would change the way businesses create and distribute information. The machine used an indirect electrostatic process patented in 1939 by Chester Carlson who named his invention after the Greek words for dry writing. It took him 11 years to develop the process and find the interested backers at Halloy, and then took them nine years to perfect the design. But it worked. They created the first plain paper copier. It could reproduce an original on virtually any paper in your office, letterhead, graph paper, even on different sizes. The machine was fast, automatic, priced low enough to attract a wide range of customers, and the cost per copy was only a few pennies. It became the biggest success in business equipment since the electric typewriter. And in 1961, Halloid Corporation changed its name to signify the process that had brought it so much fortune. In today's offices, copiers are as commonplace as fluorescent lighting. Speeds range from less than 10 copies a minute for a small desktop model to over 150 copies a minute for a large industrial duplicator. Capabilities can be tailored to a user's need and budget. A typical modern copier can make the image darker or lighter, bigger or smaller, feed documents automatically, and sort the copies into complete stapled sets. Sophisticated microprocessors give some machines features like page memory, automatic book copying, even editing. Copiers have redefined the way we do business, 
and helped set a direction for the development of office automation. We are now as dependent on them as we are on the telephone. I'll send you a copy. Bye. You're welcome. The machines being manufactured today use the same indirect electrostatic process as the original Halloid design. It can be broken down into roughly seven steps. In the following sections of this program, we'll take a closer look at each one. To the person using the machine, making a copy is a fairly simple process. Place the original, set a quantity and maybe a few parameters, and press the print button. But inside the machine are other processes responsible for producing those copies. Before you can study these processes, you need to become familiar with a special material that's the foundation of electrostatic copying. It's called the photoconductor. There are several different types of photoconductors used in copiers today, but no matter what type is involved, the basic principles are the same. To get a good look at the photoconductor, you have to see inside the copier. We can't do that very well here, but we can over here. This is the same machine reduced to the most basic elements of copier technology. This round unit in the center is one of the most popular photoconductor designs, a selenium drum. This shape allows the surface to interact with other systems inside the copier simply by rotating on a central axis. Now, what's so special about it? You've seen this stuff before. You use it in a camera. Well, a photoconductor is to a copier what film is to a camera. It captures an image and changes it into another form. But there's a key difference between film and a copier's photoconductor. Film creates an image through a chemical process. A photoconductor does the job by setting up a relationship between light and an electrical charge. We see a similar kind of relationship in photovoltaic cells, what we often call solar cells. You've probably seen these before on watches or calculators. The cells in this solar-powered calculator are made from thin layers of light-sensitive material a wafer of silicon with metallic coatings bonded to each side. When exposed to light, these cells produce electricity in direct proportion to the light shining on them. The brighter the light, the greater the voltage. A photoconductor is also made from layers of different materials, but it's not designed to produce electricity. Instead, a photoconductor stores electricity on its surface in an inverse proportion to the light shining on it. That means the brighter the light, the less electricity it can hold. Don't think of it as uh, a single battery storing a single charge. A photoconductor is more like a surface made from millions of microscopic batteries, each one able to store and discharge electricity independently. The photoconductor doesn't produce this electricity itself. Every copier has a charge system that gives the photoconductor an electrical charge right at the start of a copy cycle. Remember the meaning of xerography? Dry writing? Well, this charge is what something being copied is actually written on. The photoconductor can't capture an image without it. We'll concentrate on this system in the next section of this program. But for just now, just assume that the photoconductor has a uniform electrical charge over its entire surface. Let's look a little deeper into that surface. If you take a slice through here and magnify the cross section, the individual layers look like this. On the bottom is a layer of aluminum to give structural support. The aluminum is oxidized slightly, so it has a better grip on the next layer, a thin coating of selenium. Finally, a layer of selenium oxide is formed on top, creating what's called the trapping layer. It's the special electrical properties of selenium that make this combination effective. Selenium's electrical resistance varies with its exposure to light. In the dark, selenium is an insulator, and it won't pass electricity. But you shine some light on it, and it becomes more conductive. With enough light, 
there's virtually a direct connection through the selenium between the trapping layer and the aluminum base, a connection that doesn't exist in the dark. Here's what that means in copier terms. By exposing a photoconductor to a pattern of light that matches an original image, you can use it to make an electrical copy of whatever appears on that original. We've spent all this time talking about the photoconductor because it has such a central role in the copy process. Once you understand it, you can examine the major steps in the process and learn how the different groups of components interact. Each of those steps will be covered in a separate section of this program, but to give an idea of the type of systems involved, I'll take you through a quick overview of the whole copy process, start to finish. In a copier this size, the whole process takes about six seconds, from pushing the print button to walking away with your copy. Here's where we start. We already mentioned that the photoconductor needs an electrical charge before it can capture an image. This charge process is the first step, and it happens just after the drum starts turning. This component here, the charge corona unit, applies a charge to the photoconductor surface. After being charged, the drum rotates down to here, where an original image reaches the surface. This is the exposure process. The image is reflected from an original by several mirrors focused through a lens, and finally directed onto the photoconductor. Remember, all this happens while the drum is turning and with no other light present except what the copier is providing. After exposure, the image is electrically stored on the drum surface, but you can't see it yet. It's still only a pattern of electrical charge. At this point, we're about two seconds into the copy cycle. The next step is making that image visible, develop it. The drum's rotation brings the image area into contact with this item, the development unit. Using a combination of mechanical, electrical, and magnetic processes, this unit brushes a fine black powder over the photoconductor. The powder only sticks to the charged areas, so it creates a visible copy of the original on the drum. The next step is getting a sheet of paper into the copier, positioned so it can pick up the developed image. That's the process of paper feed. There's a paper supply over here. The copier's control system regulates feed rollers, which pull one sheet of paper from the supply and move it through the machine during each copy cycle. Okay, you've got a developed image and a sheet of paper. Now you have to bring them together. The transfer process takes place here, at about the three second mark. In the transfer process, an electrical field is produced by this unit, the transfer corona. The field pulls the coating of black powder away from the drum onto the sheet of paper. The distribution of this powder matches the original exactly, so the paper becomes a copy. Right after the transfer comes the separation process. The sheet of paper moves with the drum and passes over the separation corona. This unit produces another electrical field which frees the paper from the photoconductor. The sheet of paper now carries a visible image of the original. It moves away from the drum and passes between these two rollers. These are the fusing rollers, which apply heat and pressure to the copy creating a permanent bond between image and paper. After the fusing process, the copy's finished, but the copy cycle has one more step to go, the cleaning process. It happens back on the drum. The drum's rotation brings the photoconductor surface in contact with the cleaning unit. The cleaning process prepares the photoconductor for the next copy. First, a mechanical system removes leftover powder from the drum surface, anything that didn't transfer from the developed image to the paper. Then, a special lamp shines light on the photoconductor to remove the pattern of electrical charge from whatever was just copied. The drum now has a clean and electrically neutral surface and is ready to repeat the entire chain of processes for another copy. As you can see from this quick tour, nearly every step in the copy process involves the photoconductor. So you'll be hearing it mentioned a lot in the sections that follow. The first of those sections takes us to the starting point in a copy cycle, where the photoconductor is prepared to receive an image, the charge process. In the last section of this program, we looked at the photoconductor the material that quite literally lies at the center of the copy process. 
A photoconductor is made from a certain material that varies its electrical resistance in response to light. The more light, the less resistance. Because of this property and its particular layered construction, a photoconductor has the ability to store an electrical charge on its surface in proportion to how much light is hitting it. This enables it to make an electrical copy of an image. That charge isn't created by light or by the photoconductor itself. It's produced by a special group of components during the first step in a copy cycle, the charge process, and it takes place right here. This item is the charge corona unit. As the drum begins to rotate at the beginning of a copy cycle, the corona unit is energized and gives the photoconductor an even electrical charge. The charge applied by the corona is a little different from the electricity we normally use. AC and DC currents in our homes and appliances both flow from one place to another. But the corona unit creates a charge that stays in one place, a static charge. Static charges can develop when certain materials are rubbed together. And we notice the charge because the materials involved start to attract each other. You may have seen this happen when combing your hair. If the hair is very dry, it will be attracted to the comb. Many types of plastic tend to develop a static charge this way. It happens with glass, too, under the right circumstances, and also with some synthetic fabrics, like polyester or nylon. Here's a piece of clear acrylic. This stuff can build up a very strong charge if you rub it with the right material, like wool. The rubbing action causes the charge to build up as two opposite polarities, positive and negative, and opposite charges always attract each other. Because only one polarity of charge builds up on the acrylic, it will attract anything that's close to the opposite polarity, even things that are relatively neutral, like these bits of paper. Though fundamentally the same as the static charge on this acrylic, the charge process in a copier has one important difference. What you see here is the result of mechanical action between two materials. In a copier, the charge process creates an electrostatic charge applied by an electrical field. In terms of polarity, most copiers create a positive charge on the drum, though for some types of photoconductors, a negative charge is necessary. For our purposes, we'll assume the copier has the more popular selenium drum, which gets a positive charge. As mentioned earlier, that charge is delivered by a corona unit, like this one. It's mounted about like this, very close to the surface of the conductor. The corona unit consists of a metal housing with an electrical connection at one end. Tied to that connection on the inside is the charge corona wire. It's this wire that actually applies the charge through a carefully regulated series of events. Here's what happens to it when a copy cycle begins. Almost immediately after a copier's print button is pressed, a positive DC potential, somewhere between 5 and 10,000 volts, is applied to the corona wire. The wire isn't grounded, so this voltage can't really flow anywhere. What it does instead is cause a positive electrical field to build up in the air surrounding the wire. This electrical field spreads out from the corona unit toward the photoconductor and applies an even positive charge to the photoconductor's surface. Since this happens in the dark, the photoconductor is in a non-conductive state. So instead of flowing to ground, the positive charge on its surface keeps building up and reaches close to 1,000 volts. The copy cycle continues and the drum turns. Fresh, neutral photoconductor moves past the corona, becomes charged, and then moves on, ready to receive an image. A byproduct of charge corona discharge is the generation of ozone inside the copier. Ozone can oxidize the photoconductor surface, reducing its ability to respond to light. An exhaust blower helps avoid this problem. It pulls air through the inside of the copier to prevent the buildup of ozone over the drum. This ventilation also ensures an even distribution of ions during the charge process. The charge corona housing is usually perforated in some way to take advantage of the airflow.
The DC voltage for the charge corona is sent through a high voltage cable from a power pack, a device incorporating a step-up transformer, rectifier, and some special control electronics. A typical charge circuit works like this. The power pack is supplied with a constant low voltage directly from the copier's power supply. At the beginning of a copy cycle, the main control board triggers the power pack, which steps up the low supply voltage to the level needed for charging. The resulting output is sent through the high voltage cable to the corona wire. That's the charge process. It starts with the photoconductor, a material that's an electrical insulator in the dark, but a conductor when exposed to light. Inside the copier, shielded from the light, the photoconductor gets an even electrostatic charge from the charge corona unit. This charge prepares the photoconductor to receive an image. Getting that image onto the charged photoconductor is the next step in the copy cycle. We'll go through it in the next section of the program, the exposure system. People who work with cameras are very concerned with light, its brightness, color, and direction. They have to be. It's only by carefully controlling light that they get the desired image onto a piece of film in here. There's a similar situation inside a copier. In a sense, a copier takes a picture of something. It focuses an image onto a light-sensitive surface. In the last section, we saw how the charge process prepares the photoconductor for receiving the image of an original document. That's how a copy cycle starts. The drum's rotation has moved the charge surface over to here. This is where an image is recorded in the exposure process. When you study a copier's exposure system, the first thing to consider is the way an original document affects the light that shines on it. The lighter parts of an original, like the areas of blank paper, reflect a lot of light, while the darker parts, like the letters and lines, absorb most light. Reflection and absorption create a visible pattern anytime something is hit by light, and the pattern is an exact image of the original. To capture an image with this reflected pattern of light and dark, copiers use an exposure lamp. It shines light on the original and reflects the image inside the machine. The next step is focusing. Under most circumstances, reflected or transmitted light can't create an image simply by falling on another surface. You see, the light is there, but there's no picture. That's because the original image has to be reassembled and in a size that's suitable for the application, projector, camera, or copier. This is done by something that collects light from the original image, a lens. It directs the light onto a surface at some predetermined distance in the same pattern in which it left the original. Lenses take advantage of another property of light, refraction. This is light's tendency to bend slightly when it passes from one material into another. In a lens, that means going from air into glass and then back into air. Just as reflection makes it possible to produce an image from something, refraction enables us to reassemble that image. You add a lens to the system, and you can focus. The image is reassembled and in whatever size the situation demands. Okay, here's the process so far. Light shines onto an original. The original reflects the light, creating an image through a combination of reflection and absorption. And the lens focuses the image onto a new surface. This works fine as long as the image is being projected onto a flat surface. And in large high-speed copiers, that's exactly what happens. Xenon flash lamps expose an entire page at once, and the image is focused onto a large, flat photoconductor belt. But in most copiers, a flat original is focused onto a curved photoconductor drum. The drum design has a lot of advantages. and makes the machine quite compact, but it creates some challenges for the exposure system. The curve prevents the lens from keeping the image in focus over the entire drum surface. There's also the fact that most drums have a smaller circumference than a typical letter size original, 
one page actually wraps around more than once. Copiers get around this problem by scanning the original a little at a time while rotating the drum. In a scanning system, light is reflected from the original through a narrow slit. The original is moved across the slit at a constant speed while the drum turns at the same speed. In a few seconds, the entire image is wrapped around the drum in perfect focus. In a scanning operation, the machine avoids overlapping the image on the drum by removing the essential image details before the drum has rotated all the way around. More on that later. There are two kinds of scanning. Some copiers actually do scan like our example by moving the original on an exposure surface called a platen across a fixed slit and exposure lamp. Others keep the platen fixed in place and use a moving scanner assembly with a slit and exposure lamp. Both systems work. The former design is suitable for relatively slow copiers while the latter is used on medium to high speed machines. Here's the exposure process so far. An image is reflected from the original with an exposure lamp scanned at the same speed as the drum's rotation and then focused through a lens. But you may have noticed a problem. Using the appropriate lens for an average original, this light path has to be about four feet long. This would make even a simple copier about the size of the average desk. To get a big light path into a small box, you fold it, just like you would fold a letter to fit into an envelope. But to fold light, you use mirrors. Here's a typical light path in a scanning desktop copier. There are four mirrors, two scanners, and one lens. The exposure lamp is mounted on the first scanner. It shines light onto the original, which reflects an image onto the first mirror. The light then folds left to two more mirrors on the second scanner, which fold the light down and to the right. The lens focuses and sizes the image, projecting it onto one more mirror, which folds it again. From here, the light is reflected down onto the photoconductor. The mirrors used in copiers are called front surface mirrors and are coated with reflective material on the side facing the image. They're very susceptible to scratches. Typical household mirrors are coated on their rear surface, which makes them more durable but unsuitable for optical use. A rear surface mirror actually has two reflections, a strong one from the silver coating on the back and a faint one from the front surface of the glass. This second reflection goes unnoticed in most applications, but would produce a double image effect in a copier. Well, we've now reflected, scanned, and focused an image and folded the light path into a suitable size for a desktop copier. There's one more aspect of the optical system to consider, reproduction ratio. Most of the time you make a copy, it's the same size as the original. That's a one-to-one -one reproduction ratio. But sometimes enlargement or reduction is necessary for special applications. To do this, the copier has to change the reproduction ratio by moving some things around. It works like this. Here's an image, and here's an optical system. Now imagine that this wall is the photoconductor. So here's what we have. This projector can't produce a one-to-one -one ratio, but it doesn't matter for this example I'll just measure the image on our photoconductor here. Okay, we have an image about nine inches high. If you want to make the image smaller, what's the first thing you do? Well, generally, the farther you are from something, the smaller it looks. So to make the image on the photoconductor smaller, you have to move the lens farther away from the original. All right, the image is smaller, but now it's out of focus. To correct the focus, you decrease the distance between the lens and the photoconductor until the image becomes sharp again. To enlarge an image, you do the opposite. Decrease the distance between the lens and the original and increase the distance between the lens and the photoconductor. Instead of moving the photoconductor drum, scanning copiers with a variable reproduction ratio keep the image in focus by moving extra mirrors in the light path. The mirrors move 
to make the distance from the lens to the photoconductor shorter for enlargements and longer for reductions. This system of changing the distance on each side of the lens is all you need for enlarging and reducing the image if you're projecting the image onto a flat surface. This is the case in a high-speed copier with a flat photoconductor belt, as mentioned earlier. But the majority of copiers have a drum. Inside the machine, only the drum's horizontal dimension is parallel to the original. Its vertical dimension is a curve wrapped into a cylindrical shape. Because of the drum shape, moving the lens back and forth only affects the horizontal size of the image. Both of these examples show an image with constant vertical size, but a changed horizontal size. This one enlarged, this one reduced. A scanning copier adjusts the horizontal size by moving the lens, as you've just seen. But to adjust vertical size, it uses a completely different method. Remember how scanning works? The scanner moves across the image at a speed matching the rotation of the drum. That's only for a one-to-one -one ratio. To change the vertical image size, you change the scanner speed. Here's a one-to-one -one ratio, scanner and drum moving at the same speed. Now watch this. The drum speed is the same, but the scanner moves faster. See what happens? Since the scanner moves faster, but the drum turns at the same speed, the image covers less drum surface. It's reduced. Here's an enlargement. The scanner moves slower than normal, so the image is spread out over more drum surface. It's enlarged. This is how scanning copiers handle reproduction ratio. Two systems, a moving lens and mirrors for changing horizontal magnifications and variations in scanner speed for changing the vertical magnification. That's the optical system. The reflecting, scanning, focusing, and changing of size all have a common goal, bringing an image of the original to the photoconductor. When it gets there, it creates a sort of electrical copy. We refer to it by the same name photographers use to describe what's on a piece of film that's been exposed but not developed, a latent image. As the process begins, light from an exposure lamp reflects the image into the optical system. The light is folded by mirrors while a lens brings the image into focus. After focusing, the light reaches one more mirror which reflects the image onto the photoconductor. Since the image is a combination of lighter and darker areas, the